so first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers, uh, especially Annabella Fernandes for uh, putting together this um, one day colloquium. Um, I decided to propose this title before I wrote anything and before I thought about what I was going to say. So the talk is not exactly about blending, flipping, engaging, although uh, you will see that I, I'm going to talk about uh, my uh, experiment uh, or my experiments in the classroom. Uh, so are you still seeing my slide? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. So let me just open my text here. So my, my talk is uh, structured into uh, six moments. Um, I will start by introducing the topic as I uh, originally uh, envisioned it now when I uh, wrote um, an abstract based on this title. And then I will address uh, five topics, digital discourse, digital society, digital education, the internet and the classroom, and finally critical digital literacy. Uh, so this was my idea for the talk. So I, I was thinking about the digital medium as um, an environment that really challenges uh, our concept of classroom and teaching. Uh, so I will read my first paragraph. Instru Instructor-centered classroom teaching remains the predominant practice in higher education. The development of online learning environments has extended the repertoire of activities and modalities of synchronous and asynchronous interaction but they are often based on the premise of emulating classrooms through software constraints. I argue that the transformative potential of information and communication technologies for active learning can be enhanced if combined with an educational approach that uses the interactive, flexible and user-oriented features of the web as an ecology for engaging students in the, of, in the construction of their own knowledge. In this web-based approach to teaching, the internet itself understood both as a network of interactional practices and the highly complex knowledge base becomes the model for the learning environment. In societies that offer general access to digital infrastructure and broadband connections, face-to-face -face and remote interactions have become concurrent layers of our communication ecology. This fully connected world offers possibilities for experimentation with flipped classrooms and blended teaching that may transform classroom structures, practices, and functions. So I, I think that this introduction um, struck me as a way of, um, well, a, a way of thinking of the internet that is similar to the connection of, to the, to the, um, um, to the presentation of uh, learning uh, as a, a holistic uh, real world phenomenon based uh, collaborative uh, form of learning that we learned uh, earlier. So digital discourse. One of the theoretical issues that needs clarification when, we, when discussing the connections between education and digital society lies in using digital as a qualifier of society. What exactly does digital society mean? To what extent can a society be digital? The use of the qualifier digital as an attribute of society is at least five decades old. But the meaning of this qualifier has changed as information and communication technologies have penetrated into increasingly diverse domains of human activity. Moreover, 
the term began to appear in government policy programs since the 19, uh, in the 1990s and the rhetoric about the digitization of society, economy, education and culture can be seen in numerous policy documents since then. For instance, the digital education plan the Digital Education Action Plan of the European Union, dated January 2018, establishes three priorities that aim to address the internal transformation of teaching and learning practices, the response to external needs created by the economy, and the self-monitoring of the education systems themselves. And I quote from the document, so first priority, making better use of digital technology for teaching and learning. Second priority, developing relevant digital skills and competencies for the digital transformation. Third priority, improving education systems through better data analysis and foresight. Recognizing the increasing digitization of the modes of production and their impact on the required training skills, the plan synthesizes and recycles 30 years of discursive production on the digitization of education as a way of responding to the digitization of society. And I quote, digital technology enriches learning in a variety of ways and offers learning opportunities which must be accessible to all. It opens up access to a wealth of information and resources. And additionally, Europe's digital transformation will accelerate with the rapid advance of new technologies like artificial intelligence, robotics, cloud computing and blockchain. Like previous major technological advances, digitization affects how people live, interact, study and work. Some jobs will disappear, others will be replaced, new jobs will be created, many jobs in industries will be transformed and new activities will emerge. This makes investing in one's digital skills throughout life of the utmost importance. So let's move on to this, the discussion of digital society. We could distinguish three moments in this production of digital society as both historical process and rhetorical trope. The first moment when society managed, imagines itself as digital occurs in the 1970s and 1980s, when the personal digital computer enables processes of mechanization and operation, operationalization of writing to leave the office and gradually enter homes, schools, and libraries. The second moment occurs when the development and expansion of the World Wide Web and the creation of protocols enable communication between all terminals within uh, all networks based on the internet infrastructure in the 1980s and early 2000s. The third moment takes shape through the coupling of cloud computing and the generalization of mobile communication, smartphones and social software, in particular during the last decade and a half. The digitization of society coincides at first with process of digitizing those activities that are mediated by the production and reading of texts and gradually of other forms of media inscription, including the various technologies for capturing, storing, and reproducing image, sound, and moving image. This initial moment is dominated by the beginning of the digitization processes of catalogs and textual and media archives of the cultures of humanity, and by the perception of the digital medium as a technology that enhances analog forms of inscription, in particular of the bibliographic and knowledge archives. This moment is also dominated 
by the imaginary of the software as a new form of writing with liberating powers and by the understanding of computer programming as a new kind of literacy. So this is really interesting because if we go back to the 1970s when some of the uh, pioneer engineers were designing what would become the graphical user interface and the model for our interaction with computers, we see that uh, the language that they are using uh, envisions this utopian uh, future for uh, programming. Uh, and I think we, the, the kind of digital world that we have now is very, very different from the one that was imagined by those early uh, engineers. The second moment extends the hypertextual and hypermedia structure of information to the entire digital network, making it possible to share, transfer, and analyze files and data in increasingly larger quantities. With the progressive development of data storage and communication infrastructures, as well as powerful search engines, the electronic network of personal computers and servers, and all the production, indexing, and communication activities that uh, it enables became the new incarnation of the digital society. This connectivity also served as a model for the development of teaching forms and practices that try to recreate on the internet the ecology of content modularization and communicative learning interactions. The third moment takes shape with the parallel development of the modeling of social interactions in digital media. So what we now refer to as social networks or social media networks, the explosion of cloud computing as a storage and processing ecology in real time, the territorial expansion of mobile communication networks and the engineering of the smartphone as a multifunctional pocket computer able to emulate all of humanity's media technologies. This rapid set of techno-social transformations provides yet another layer of meaning to the phrase digital society, since it is now no longer just the metonymic trans transference from relatively circumscribed domains, that of reading and writing, as in the first moment, or the communication networks and audiovisual media as in the second moment, but rather the very redefinition of social sociability and modes of production as they become dependent on digital mediation. The phrase digital society at the present time is not only less metonymic than it was in 1980 or 2000, but the ways in which digital society is digital is no longer exactly the same as it was when the phrase came into use as a descriptor of, fut of a future that was still under formation. In other words, the metaphor that it contains is no longer the same. The fact that we continue to use the same expression obscures the radical transformation of its field of reference. Its field of reference is at once smaller than we assume since many features of our social practices cannot be ascribed to the digital as such, and larger than we imagine, since many new patterns of behavior, forms of labor and social control have acquired a digital substratum. So now let's move to digital education. If we look at the process of, dig of the digitization of society from the point of view of formal teaching practices and education policies of the last three decades, we will recognize those three moments. A first moment in which the information and communication technologies were mainly understood as a set of skills for using certain software programs, word processors, spreadsheets, image editors, Etc., or for modularizing and cross-referencing re cross hypertext and multimedia information within specific disciplines. So if we go back to the 1990s and we look at the CD-ROM industry, or we look at the ways uh, information and communication technologies, technologies were being introduced in school curricula, we'll see this, this uh, 
uh, we, we will see documents of this first uh, moment. A second moment in which applications for sharing materials and communication are developed through the modeling of virtual classrooms for distance learning in asynchronous in an asynchronous regime. And the third moment in which the smartphone and mobile connectivity change the spatial and temporal dynamics of face-to-face -face and distance uh, interactions, as well as of synchronous and asynchronous regimes. The expression digitization of education undergoes an identical process of metonymic reduction. Initially, digitization mainly affects the sources of information used as teaching resources, as well as the ways of finding and cross-referencing that information. At a second moment, a set of formal learning processes and the characteristic interactions of formalized classroom instruction are modeled through systems that replicate those teaching models in the context of network communication. The development of distance learning or B-learning digital platforms corresponds to this modeling. At a third stage, the borders of the classroom itself as the central structure of formal education with its assumption of hierarchical administration of scarce and compartmentalized information dissolve due to the combined effect of the multiplication of network programmable di digitized resources and the overlap lap of face-to-face -face with network interface interactions. The internet and the classroom. My practice, so this is the section of, the, of my uh, talk that is uh, related with the um, initial abstract. My practice as teacher and learner reflects this awareness of the transformative nature of, tel of the telecommunication situation in which we find ourselves when we think about it from the classroom protocols. The notion that the classroom should be fully integrated into the internet has been tentatively explored in my courses since the early 2000s in three types of experimental teaching practices, in projects that have sought to bring together annotated selected resources across disciplinary areas. And I think this corresponds to the first uh, stage in shared writing projects based on collective and cumulative on the collective and cumulative work of all learners over a period of time and in processes for co-constructing the curriculum by means of networks of topics and problems defined by learners uh, based on a guided exploration of the electronic media space. So these are my examples. So this, this is my first example. Uh, this project uh, really started in 2003, 2004. So this was before the wiki uh, and the blog uh, period, before the social network period. Uh, and it's, it's clear. So the, the, this was an attempt of really doing away with the, uh, let's say, the, the disciplinary borders uh, across all the subjects that I was teaching. And so I was trying to create a resource that could bring together uh, all, the, all the courses that I was teaching and mix uh, the different resources and expose the students to uh, that uh, mix. The second example, uh, it's a post blog moment. No, so this was started in 2006. And this was uh, active between 2006 and 2009. And this was a, a collective writing uh, experiment in, 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 the, in the classroom. So uh, the, the collaboration uh, involved uh, a continuous stream of writing by all uh, stu students and, and, and by the, the teacher. The third example, a more recent example, uh, it's, it's an example that corresponds to the third kind of project. So 
an attempt to not just create an ongoing writing um, collaborative uh, stream during the course, but also of opening that stream to input, specific input and specific interests and content that is brought by the students. And so that content uh, is, uh, becomes part of the, of the curriculum. Uh, so it's, I would say that 20%, maybe 25% of the curriculum is not predefined. Uh, it, it's um, a consequence of what happens uh, during the interaction. The abundance of available information, the collaborative edit editability of that information and the permanent connectivity allows us to re redefine the place and function of the classroom in the construction of knowledge. Instead of merely performing as a disciplinary space for validating knowledge based on the syllabus predefined by the instructor, the classroom can be integrated into the internet, becoming a temporary evolving node, which reconfigures itself according to associative heterarchical, uh, and this morning the speaker was, was talking about heterarchies, and socialized principles of this form of open sharing and discovering of information in the construction of knowledge. Finally, and this is my last talk, topic, uh, critical digital literacy. Finally, I must also mention that the digitization of society in its current manifest manifestation must be understood as a fundamental ethical and political problem. Circumscribing the scope of the concept to the emancipatory component of access to humanity's media archive and to the possibilities of communication and collaboration in our production and communication processes is to ignore the transformation of a growing number of human actions, thoughts, and, desirable, and desires into traceable and capitalizable data. So this, is, this has also been mentioned in, in an earlier talk. From this angle, the digitization of society implies the destruction of labor, social and political rights that underline the legal regulation of our current system of social organization. A critic of the automation of symbolic production and of the permanent monitoring of our activities must therefore be an integral part of a critical digital literacy beyond the strictly functional competence in the use of hardware and software. The digital is a new mode of economic production for which we still lack an adequate critical vocab vocabulary. Mackenzie Wark has analyzed the current system through the concept of vectoralist class, which she uses to describe the emergence of a new class that monopolizes and capitalizes information and the algorithmic processing of information. And I quote, a capitalist class owns the means of production, the means of organizing labor. A vectorist class owns the means of organizing the means of production. The vector as a double form, the form of vector along which information is to be routed, the extensive vector, and the form of the vector along which information can be stored in computing, the intensive vector. A vectorist class also owns and controls the production process through patents, copyrights, brands, trademarks, proprietor, proprietary logistical processes, and the like. So one of the, I think, changes that the um, visionary engineers uh, such as Alan Kay or Douglas Engelbart uh, or Ted Nelson uh, or, or, or many of the others who invented uh, some of the principles of interface uh, interaction with programs uh, and computers would not imagine is the kind of dominance that very few information, internet, uh, corporations now have over the entire planet. So this is uh, really what um, I think Mackenzie Wark is hinting at here uh, with a reference to the vectorist class. So there's a new 
way of controlling uh, production, which is the control of information and the control of attention, uh, of our attention uh, span. Insofar as the general digitization of natural and social processes is the culmination of the Cartesian dream of reducing the world to numerical representa representations capable of modeling all matter and all processes, including human actions and thoughts, the calculability that underlies computational processing institutes a relentless apparatus of exploitation and control of work, of thought, of the imagination. This apparatus of exploitation and control is currently incorporated into principles and, syst and systems of social management, including the formal teaching and learning systems themselves, as well as the infrastructures of big data companies that sustain the computational production mode. Setting limits to this control function is an ethical imperative at this historical moment when the qualifying of society as digital is less and less metonymic and an increasingly larger set of practices and social interactive actions are being digitized. Thus, blending, flipping, engaging, that is, changing the concept of classroom teaching in ways that reshape our practice in the network digital medium only go so far if it does not interrogate the digital itself as a contested and negotiated ensemble of structures and formations that have far reaching consequences. So thank you. Muito obrigada, Manuel, pela interrogação ao conceito digital. Passamos agora para o Nuno Coelho, que nos vai falar o que significa TBD. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Tora for the invitation to speak at this um, meeting. Uh, uh, it's been inspiring listening to all the, the talks that we've uh, been listening today. And I don't know what to say after Manuel's Portela's presentation that was very inspiring. <laughs> um, and I, uh, first of all, I will start with my title TBD. So uh, I decided to have like a, a, a to because I was the, the last person of the program. I decided to to make a, a little provocation, <laughs> uh, having a short title and not a long title, which is the norm in this kind of conferences, and uh, to be a bit more enigmatic, let's say. Um, but to be honest, uh, the very first reason why I had this uh, small title is because I still uh, I struggled a bit, and I it took me a long time to come up with the theme that I would like to speak today. Uh, so the program was released without even uh, having a, a like a, a settled title for my presentation but then uh, it, i took these three letters to you know to to come up with something that i would like to to share with you so um and my presentation will will uh, go around uh, the concept of time and the concept uh, and many concepts that uh, portella just mentioned today um, uh, just before, so I would like to share like uh, some some things I've been reflecting um, for uh, for the people that don't know me. So my background in CV is in fine arts, and I've been teaching in the University of Coimbra for twelve years. And it, it and uh, I would like to bring my uh, let's say my subjectivity, which is something that is not very addressed in the scientific conferences, uh, because it took me a, a long time, and I'm still. Uh, going through that process of how to adjust into um, a set of norms uh, that, uh, uh, in my personal uh, belief, kind of formats the way you think and the way you uh, envision new ways of reflecting on the things you do and the things, and uh, me as an educator, someone that comes from the culture field, and uh, we live in a digital society. So I would like to uh, I chose three words to define the, these three letters, uh, TBD. So think before design. So I didn't have enough time to think about the presentation that I was uh, uh, aiming to do today. So many times because of uh, lack of time, we try 
we try to design before uh, thinking. We, we are living in an ever accelerating digital society. So I would like, I would like to bring some, uh, uh, some thoughts uh, based on uh, a South Korean, uh, German-based um, uh, philosopher, uh, Ban Jung uh, Chu Han. And um, he published a book recently, like uh, saying that we, uh, there's two kinds of uh, pathological panoramas, uh, a viral one and a neural one. So I don't have to explain these images. So we're uh, uh, presently living a viral uh, panorama which is based on negativity. Uh, so we don't want to be contaminated. So we protect ourselves. We protect from the negativity of someone else. But uh, his book talks uh, uh, more on the neuronal uh, uh, principle. And the neuron, neuronal principle is based on not on negativity, but on, on positivity. We are hyperactive. We are. Uh, we work too much. We um, don't have enough time to think uh, before working. So this um, pathological panorama based on uh, positivity uh, leads to uh, many problems and diseases that are not. Um, I would say they are very absent from the discussions around academia. Uh, uh, I don't see many uh, plans addressing specifically uh, depression or HDHD or burnout syndrome among academia. Uh, there's, but there's many uh, plans for to foster our hyperactivity and producing papers and producing uh, so much uh, knowledge. But uh, I think we are running out of time. So um, what this and this is like these kind of uh, disorders are on the individual level, not on collectively. So these kind of um, problems and diseases uh, affect uh, the personal level and affect that person ability to establish ties and bonds with other individuals and that's what makes us as social beings and that um that is characteristic of the growing fragmentation and then atomization of the social sphere so because we are overloaded with work and because we have so many papers to to publish and many conferences to attend and classes to uh, redesign uh, every year uh, so there's this a constantly fragmentation of uh, of uh, oneself and this is being reinforced uh, by this excess of positivity this ever-growing production constant production this overwork and i think um dr kilonan is uh, this afternoon uh, was telling that one of the key aspects was uh, well-being um so i i thought that was a, a, a very um, interesting point uh, so uh, this excess of positivity is um, obviously is expressed by the excess of stimuli, um, information, impulses that we get from the you know the, the outside world um, that is being exacerbated by the the you know the the, uh, the, the pla um, online platforms. Uh, um, and this has a tremendous uh, huge impact on our attention, uh, on, on our perception, um, because our attention and then our perception also beco uh, and becomes also fragmented and very di di disper um, dispersed. Uh, we, we'll, we'll, try, we'll, we'll try always to be all over the place. So, um, and I think this, the, here in this uh, this point, there's a, a direct link with what Potello was just saying. Is um, so with the help of the new digital technologies, uh, uh, forms of measuring positivity have been created. So our society is governed by rankings, awards, evaluations, uh, all sorts of types of measurements, and there's you know a pretty much. Um, a technological tool to to measure that every every year or every three years we have to evaluate ourselves through 
um, putting charts of, uh, uh, with numbers of our evaluations and everything that we be being produced. Um, and um, meritocracy as well, and uh, uh, multitasking. So, uh, probably some of us were, were doing something else while we were watching uh, the other speakers. Uh, and this society, I think we promote that a lot. Um, Usually, I, I use the joke among with my students that uh, the, when I, I'm asked, I, I teach design, and when students ask me which is the the software that I recommend for them to you know to work, and uh, when they ask me what which is the software I, I use the most, I I joke with them saying that uh, Excel, Excel is the <laughs> is I'm I'm feel, having this feel, this feeling that I'm always filling up uh, um, techno bureaucracy. And this kind of normalization, these, uh, these norms that we have to follow, uh, these boxes that we have to fill. Um, and I think there's a link with the Eric Madeira talk this morning. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's a way of patronizing the way we have to conform. So there's, a, there's no much freedom to fall out of these boxes that people ask us uh, constantly to fill. Um, and there's, and because of this, there's no room for um, uh, for when things like a pandemic happens, when impredic impredicability doesn't fit into boxes, doesn't fit into, into Excel tables, uh, and also Excel tables, there's no room for subjectivity for the individual. Um, <clears throat> so. Going to the philosopher I just uh, mentioned, and, uh, and I think this presentation was deeply inspired by reading his readings. Uh, he has this quote from his book, uh, The Burnout Society, that says that, and I quote, we owe the cultural achievements of humanity, which include philosophy, to deep contemplative attention. Culture presumes an environment in which deep attention is possible. And for, for us to have a deep attention, uh, we need to have time. Uh, we need to have, uh, we need to have uh, time to be without doing anything. <laughs> um, we, in an ever, ever accelerating digital society, there's no room for boredom. And deep boredom, uh, and Han goes and says, deep boredom promotes the creative process. So uh, only attention is able to capture uh, the small mundane things, uh, um, the, the, the simple things uh, that surround us and sometimes that makes us think in a different way. And only attention, if it, if it is done slowly and time consuming, and for that we, I, I, I reinforce, we need time, is not compatible with the hyperactivity that uh, I think pretty much all of us uh, feel on a daily routine. Uh, so Nietzsche, quoted by Hahn, also says that, and I quote, from lack of repose, our civilization is turning into a new barbarism. At no time I have the active, that is to say the restless, counted for more. That is why one of the most necessary corrections to the character of mankind that, ha that have to be taken in hand is a considerable strengthening of the contemplative element in it. So Nietzsche goes and says that uh, for uh, us, educators, uh, we need to teach these three tasks. Um, to see, uh, to think, and to speak and write. So focusing on the first one, to see, which is related to a, a pedagogy of vision, we need to um, um, to train the eye to serenity, to, to patience. Someone, uh, someone today uh, said this, this, this word and I, I enjoy listening to it, like patient, um, patience. Um, and to have serenity and patience, we have, it, it requires deep attention. And uh, deep attention, serenity, and patience, uh, please do, do not confuse with passivity. Uh, patience is actually an, an active uh, action. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> um, 
So in a digital society where digital technologies are so pervasive and uh, ubiquitous, uh, and now my phone tells me every week uh, my weekly report of much time I spend looking at the screen. I'm always shocked because I spend more time than I am aware. Um, so a digital society lives for acceleration uh, because like these tools help us to be more uh, effective and fast. But because of that, it's not that we are more having, we have more time to do other things. Actually, we have more time to do more, uh, more work or uh, uh, more um, uh, to be more productive. So um, there's less and less room for interruption, for to have a break, uh, to disaccelerate. So I think all of us or most of us will agree with me, like we don't have, like we, everyone that, that doesn't have like uh, defined borders of um, on their working time. So working hours, uh, sometimes we will work, many times we were working overnight on the weekends and uh, on holidays. I've seen uh, during summer holidays, uh, I've, I've seen friends posting on social media saying, finally I have time to work. Um, and this be, is being celebrated. Our society celebrates uh, uh, people that are working uh, after hours. So, and I think this is a problem. I think this is, uh, we need a culture to condemn uh, a, a system that, that um, blurs the, um, the, the, uh, the borders between what should be working time and leisure time, because we need that to think. We need time to, um, to, to, um, to, uh, to be less stressed, <laughs> let's say in a simple way. So because we don't, don't have so much time to think, we just keep doing the same things all over again. So there is less and less time for room for transformation. So, and again, Han uh, is, he goes and says that paradoxically, hyperactivity represents an extremely passive form of doing which part the possibility of reaction. Uh, it is based on a positive potency that has been made absolute to the exclusion of all self. So he goes and says that um, uh, before there was a, the, a concept that was um, there was a, a pejorative expression which was cerebral drop uh, cerebral doping that now was the, the very same concept was um, suffered like a rebranding process and now is neuro enhancement. So and this uh, reminds me a lot of. Uh, uh, George Orwell's 1984 uh, book, um, when he introduced the, the concept of the newspeak, this language that abolished all the negative uh, concepts in the, in, the, in the society represented in the book. So <clears throat> from my personal experience as an educator, uh, I think, and uh, many of us, uh, men before me, uh, were mentioning skills, and and um, when I when I'll refer skills in this part, I'm not referring um, the skills that uh, Dr. Kilonen was mentioning. Um, I'm talking more ab about instrument instrumental and operating skills. So, m from my experience as an educator and uh, reading all the comments uh, that the students leave at the end of the semester they focus too much that they think that the education is the learning of skills, uh, how to use tools, how to use, in my case, software. Um, and uh, this is fostered, I think, by the fragmentation and dispersion of the result, uh, as the result of this um, omnipresence of the digital technologies. Um, so 
I, my focus as an educator is also, uh, because I'm talking about design, I'm, I'm, it's, um, I'm also focusing, uh, I'm mainly focusing on the, how to develop abstract thinking. Um, and uh, one of the ways I found it and uh, establishing a link with uh, between education and culture, I encourage them to consume and to produce uh, all types of forms of culture. Um, and they sometimes they don't see a direct link between uh, me um, encouraging them to see and go and watch an exhibition or a film or um, any other thing and they they don't see the direct link because there isn't between that activity and the project they're doing in the classroom and um and that's 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 uh, that's my uh, area of, uh, um, uh, let's say, of action. So going back to the title of this event, and, um, and here I'm reversing the order of the words of the title of the event, we have these three words. And, um, and I think I'm going to leave with uh, one sentence that tries to link and bond together these three concepts, which is, uh, in an ever-accelerating digital society, there, there is an urgent need for an education that is rooted and that fosters culture. So, and for that, we, we need an education that uh, leaves room for contemplation. We need time to be bored. Uh, we need time for leisure. We need time to find things by chance uh, we need time to think uh, to find things by serendipity uh, and uh, without that time for ourselves we don't uh, find new ways to think about how to organize uh, our society um, so um, I would just uh, end the, this uh, this small presentation, uh, which is I, I, it's more like a, an essay. It's not like a, a fixed <laughs> finding, but um, I would just say that uh, we can only think and and we can only be creative when we are not feeling exhausted. <laughs> so um, and going back to the to the you know the. Um, to what TBD really means uh, to be determined. Uh, so I think because I'm the last person in this program, so I think this program was the starting point of something else. And uh, what the future will bring out of this event, uh, I would just, the answer is on the screen, I think is yet to be determined. And I think we should leave it open. I think we need time to think before design. And I think that's it. I would like to thank you. Muito obrigada, um, Nuno. Uh, nós estamos uh, uh, um bocadinho além da hora que estava indicada no programa, mas uh, vamos aproveitar o tempo, um pouco mais de paciência e pedir que não seja estabelecida a analogia com o cinema, que este é o momento em que as pessoas se levantam e não prestam atenção à ficha técnica. Isso eu pedi um bocadinho mais de, para compreenderem que uma ideia sem enquadramento institucional, sem um trabalho em equipa e sem interação não existe. E por isso um, peço desculpa uh, às pessoas que apresentaram algumas perguntas uh, no espaço público que iremos ver com atenção e com um bocadinho mais de paciência então pedia-vos para ouvirem os agradecimentos que eu vou ler para não me distrair posso esquecer-me de alguém e não queria de todo esquecer-me. Então, sendo agora um discurso um bocadinho mais formal, excelentíssima senhora vice-reitora, doutora Cláudia Cavadas, excelentíssimos senhores diretores da Faculdade de Letras e da Faculdade de Psicologia e Ciências da Educação, excelentíssimo senhor coordenador científico do Centro de Estudos Interdisciplinares do século XX, Excelentíssimas senhoras oradoras, excelentíssimos senhores oradores, estimadas colegas, estimados colegas, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, o Encontro Internacional de Diálogos e Investigação sobre Cultura, Educação e Sociedade Digital 
trouxe consigo uma grande pluralidade de linguagens acerca da realidade digital e analógica, examinando e discutindo os desafios sobre o que se não sabe e também sobre o que não se sabe se sabemos. As minhas primeiras palavras são de agradecimento endereçadas às entidades que coorganizaram o encontro, à Reitoria, na pessoa da Sra. Vice-Reitora Dra. Cláudia Cavadas, pelo acolhimento da ideia, ao Instituto de Investigação Interdisciplinar, na pessoa da sua diretora, Dra. Cláudia Cavadas, a quem agradeço o empenho e apoio, ao Centro de Estudos Interdisciplinares do Século XX, na pessoa do seu coordenador, Dr. José Oliveira Martins, pela confiança. Aos oradores, agradeço a qualidade, a excelência das comunicações que nos privilegiaram pela experiência e conhecimento, potenciando, sem dúvida, uma reflexão aprofundada acerca da aplicabilidade das tecnologias digitais em contextos culturais, educacionais e societais, um agradecimento aos moderadores, a doutora Maria Manuel Borges e a doutora Alexandre Sá, que mantiveram o dinamismo dos painéis de discussão. Agradeço também a todas e a todos os que participaram online pelo interesse manifestado. Saúdo de forma particular, quer a comissão organizadora, Clara Barata, Clara Serrano, Joana Cortes Smith e Sara Dias Trindade, quer a equipa de comunicação dos três Is, bem como Marlene Taveira, e Ângela Lopes, do 620. Termino com um agradecimento especial aos colegas que não tiveram muita visibilidade neste evento, mas com quem discuti possíveis linhas temáticas. Dr. Carlos Reis, Dr. Delfim Leão, Dr. Isabel Festas, Dra. Joana Vieira Santos, Dra. Ana Teresa Peixinho, Dra. Clara Almeida Santos e as amigas e colegas Ana Isabel Ribeiro e Joana Cortes Smith, que me têm apoiado na concretização desta ideia. Gostaria também de deixar uma nota sobre como os diálogos que hoje aqui tivemos se poderão reconstituir e desenvolver por outras vias organizativas, eventualmente através da elaboração de um observatório, da criação de consórcios e de projetos europeus. Nesse sentido, este encontro apresentou-se como um ponto de partida por uma tentativa de reconstrução intelectual, heterogénea e interdisciplinar da cultura, da educação e da sociedade digital. Sendo bem evidente o impacto da atual incerteza e desconfiança, o caminho parece apontar para prudência epistemológica. O desafio que se coloca à universidade e o desafio que nos colocamos significará encontrar os fóruns adequados para pensar as interrogações globais decorrentes de uma exigência ética e estética, que dê em conta da inseparabilidade entre a progressão científica, técnica e social, bem como do modo como as tecnologias digitais configuram a construção do conhecimento e o seu efeito no contexto formal de ensino e aprendizagem no ensino superior. Deste encontro fica assim o convite a que se reflita sobre a complexidade da realidade, ou melhor será dizer, das realidades, expostas a diversos métodos de as interrogarem, incorporando o senso comum, entendido aqui como conhecimento acumulado ao longo da experiência vivida, no conhecimento científico, o que nos ajudará a antecipar o que poderá correr menos bem e a mitigar as vulnerabilidades. A todas e a todos, muito obrigada.